Welcome to Secrets True Crime, The Disappearance of Jessica Hamby. I am your host, Amber Sitton. What is done in darkness will eventually come to light. That is the purpose of this podcast, to shine light on the disappearance of Jessica Hamby. Listener discretion is advised. The subject matter may involve violence, sexual content, murder, and adult themes. It is not suitable for younger listeners. This is Episode 10 of Season 3 of a serialized podcast, and the episodes are designed to be listened to in order. Before we get started today, we'll go ahead and acknowledge that my voice sounds terrible, and I apologize. I've been sick, and this is the best I've got. Jessica Leanne Hamby has been missing since January 3rd, 2018. At the time of her disappearance, the 24-year-old mother of three was a beautiful brunette with big hazel eyes. She had a head full of long, thick hair. She was five foot two inches tall and weighed about 125 pounds. In the four and a half years since Jessica was last reported to be seen, the stories regarding her disappearance and fate have been plentiful and the facts scarce. We are starting from the beginning, and by the beginning, we are beginning with Jessica's life six months prior to her disappearance as we bring you the findings of our investigation in real time. I want to update you on our efforts to help Kim have an investigation opened into her son, Jeremy Abbott's death, and have his remains exhumed for the autopsy that should have been completed in the beginning. We have started an online petition that will be presented to the District Attorney in Marion County and also to the Alabama Attorney General, Steve Marshall's office. The link to the petition is in the episode description in your podcast players, and we've also shared it on our social media. Jeremy and Jessica's families both need your help and support with this. Please take time to review the petition and sign if you agree his death needs further investigation. Your time and support are greatly appreciated. On the night of January 2nd, 2018, Jessica Hamby found a ride from Journey Detox to Gilbert Shaw's camper in the Hamilton Hackleburg area of Marion County, where she met up with Alicia Motes, Derek Motes, Eric Edwards, Shane Reynolds, Gilbert Shaw, and likely others. At that time, Eric Edwards drove a white 2004 Chevrolet Tahoe. Whether Eric was driving the Tahoe and whether it was operable that night has been a point of contention since early on in Jessica's disappearance, and there has been much speculation and drama on this topic. The truth on the subject isn't any more clear today than it was four and a half years ago, so we are going to provide you with the information we do have. Eric and his family members have stated that the Tahoe was in the shop for repairs, or a few of them have just said that they think it was in the shop, but they can't remember with certainty. If you recall, Shane Reynolds stated that on the night of January 2nd, He was down the road at a friend's when he received a call from Eric Edwards asking him to give them a ride from Gilbert Shaw's camper back to the Edwards property on Elgin Cochran Road. Shane claimed that Eric needed a ride because his Tahoe was in the shop. Gilbert Shaw told a different story. According to what Shaw told Michael, Shane and Eric both had a vehicle at his camper that night although Shaw couldn't remember for sure exactly what vehicle Eric was driving. He said it was either his white Tahoe or his mom's blue Nissan Maxima. 
To our knowledge, Louise didn't have a Maxima, but she did drive a dark blue Nissan Altima. Gilbert also said that in the early morning hours of January 3rd, he was awakened by Eric Edwards revving the engine of the Tahoe outside his camper. The issue with Gilbert's statements is that much of what he has said has proven to be false, so his statements about the Tahoe are unreliable. According to comments made by SBI Special Agent Robbie Barton during a recorded interview, they received confirmation that Eric's Tahoe was in the shop at some point, but they were unable to determine exactly when. He stated that the shop was actually a shade tree mechanic who kept no records. One source has told us that after Jessica's disappearance, Eric Edwards attempted to sell or pawn the Tahoe at a pawn shop in Hackleburg, but the shop refused to take it. That pawn shop has closed, and so far we have not been able to confirm the accuracy of that information. A friend of Eric's named Heather came forward and gave a statement to law enforcement and to the private investigator about the Tahoe. She stated that sometime between when Jessica was last seen on January 3rd and when she herself was arrested on January 9th, she went to the Edwards property on Elgin Cochran Road. She said she, Eric, and Aaron Motes were sitting in the Tahoe getting high. Heather said that she saw Jessica Hamby's clothes in the back of Eric's Tahoe. She explained that she knew they were Jessica's clothes because Eric Edwards told her they were, and he said that Jessica would be back to get them. Heather stated that she didn't know Jessica, and this was obviously well before Jessica was reported missing, so at the time, she didn't think anything was unusual. She told the private investigator that Eric often had people in and out of his home. She also said that she found a phone in the back of the seat in the Tahoe. She told the private investigator that Eric Edwards and Aaron Motes were freaking out over the phone. Heather described it as a black phone with a cracked screen, and she noted that the phone was not turned on. She repeated several times that Eric Edwards and Aaron Motes had the phone and were tripping out over it. Aaron Motes is Alicia and Derek Motes' cousin, and like his cousins, Aaron, too, has an extensive criminal history. He was in the Franklin County Jail when Jessica disappeared. It appears he was released from jail on January 6th, which helps narrow down the time frame of when Heather could have seen Jessica's clothes in the Tahoe. It would have been on either January 6th, 7th, or 8th. Rocky West is another man that has been connected to the stories surrounding Jessica's disappearance from very early on that we haven't discussed yet. Rocky also has an extensive criminal history, and get your pen and paper ready, because all of this will get quite confusing before we are done. As you've heard in earlier episodes, Raymond and Louise adopted Eric and they also either adopted or took in their four nieces, all sisters. Two of the nieces we've never named because they were minors at the time of Jessica's disappearance, ages 14 and 17. The other two sisters are Stephanie and Tiffany Cochran. Both have lived with Raymond and Louise on and off throughout the years, and both Stephanie and Tiffany dated Rocky West within months and maybe even weeks of each other. You'll hear more about Stephanie and Tiffany later in this episode. Rocky West was interviewed by a special agent with the SBI and a private investigator. He claimed he gave Eric a ride to Tennessee on January 1st, 2018. He said that Eric paid him to drive him there because the Tahoe wasn't running. 
he thought it needed a drive shaft and thought he remembered seeing the Tahoe at the Edwards house that day, but he said he wasn't sure and he couldn't swear to it. He noted at this time he was dating Stephanie Cochran. Rocky told the two investigators that he, Eric Edwards, Derek Motes, and another man named Trannon went to Tennessee to buy dope. Trannon was in a relationship with Tiffany Cochran at that time. There are many statements from various people about these dope runs to Tennessee, and from the information in hand, it appears these runs occurred as often as every two to three days. One woman involved said that when they made these trips, it was always two men and two women that went and that they dressed up so that if they were stopped by law enforcement along the way, they could act as if they were just two couples out on a double date. It appears that it was common for the group to make a stop in Florence on their way back home. While I could speculate what these stops were for, I won't because we do not have any hard evidence at this time. There were many people who made these runs with Eric, including Stephanie and Tiffany. One woman made a statement claiming that Eric liked to take different women with him. Her words were a bit more graphic than I'll use here, but basically she explained that Eric took the women with the hopes that the women would exchange sex for extra dope. If any women accompanied them on this trip, Rocky did not provide their names. Rocky said they almost didn't make it back that night because Eric Edwards tried to set them up with Hackleburg Police Chief Kenny Hallmark. Rocky claimed the only reason Eric Edwards was not in jail at the time was because he was snitching to Chief Kenny Hallmark and possibly others too. The SBI agent asked Rocky how he knew Eric was trying to set them up. Rocky said that his good friend Trannon had a sick grandfather, and they were in a hurry to get back to him. He said that Eric kept trying to waste time. Rocky described first becoming uncomfortable about it when he drove an out-of-the-way route and Eric kept questioning him about what route they were going to take. As we listened to this interview, we had the impression that Rocky felt Eric wanted to know the travel route in advance so he could share it with law enforcement. Rocky claimed the only role he and his friend played in this trip was driving Eric to pick up the drugs, but it was Rocky's vehicle and he was driving, so he and Trannon hid the dope for the trip back. Rocky noted that when Eric saw what they did with the dope, he seemed to panic about it. He said on their way back, Eric wanted them to drive a particular route, and what really made him suspicious was that Eric wanted him to stop at a man named Cody's house, even though Eric had just spoken to Cody on the phone, and Cody had told him he wasn't at home. Rocky stated they dropped Eric and Derek off at Eric's camper on the Edwards property on Elgin Cochran Road, and he and Trannon went back to Trannon's house. He said after they arrived back at Trannon's, people were swarming around them in the woods, and he had to call his mom to come pick him up. As he described all this, there's no doubt Rocky sounded paranoid, but it might not sound quite as crazy when paired with some other information. Remember in the last episode, we told you about a woman who messaged Eric Edwards on the night of January 2nd, approximately 24 hours after Rocky made this run to Tennessee with Eric. She warned Eric that Hackleburg Chief Kenny Hallmark was asking around about him. Hallmark had been on the Marion County Drug Task Force in years past, and there is some information out there that he may have been still working on a drug task force in the general area in some capacity, but we have not been able to confirm that. In the early morning hours on January 3rd, 
this woman messaged Eric again to say that Chief Hallmark had been asking some of her family members about him on January 2nd. She told him to watch out, be careful, take a time out, and clean up. She also named a second source that she'd received the same information from, and she noted that it had to be pretty serious for that source to reach out to her. You'll hear about one other event that may or may not connect to this a little later in this episode. While we don't know the exact date, we believe that law enforcement had tracked Jessica's destination from Journey Detox to the Edwards property by the end of January 2018, and that is the approximate time frame that law enforcement made their first visit to Elgin Cochran Road to speak to the Edwards about Jessica. An unnamed law enforcement source told us that the Tahoe was parked in the Edwards yard when they arrived. The unnamed source said that when law enforcement arrived that day, Eric Edwards was passed out in the Tahoe, and they could smell the fumes from cleaning supplies coming from inside the vehicle. When officers approached the vehicle, the source said that Eric came to and resumed cleaning the inside of the Tahoe. A month or more later, on February 26, 2018, Louise Edwards filed a complaint against Rocky West for stealing Eric's Tahoe. Louise said the axle broke on it, and Eric parked it on the side of Elgin Cochran Road near County Road 43. According to the complaint filed, she stated the Tahoe was stolen on either February 1st or 2nd. It is unclear why it took over three weeks from the time the vehicle was allegedly stolen for Louise to sign the complaint. Rocky was arrested on March 20th, 2018, in conjunction with another charge for inciting a riot. The bond for the theft of the vehicle was $15,000 but it was consolidated with the other charge, making the total bond $22,500. Rocky's mother put her property up to bond him out of jail, and attorney Tony Glenn represented him. The interview with Rocky by the SBI agent and the private investigator occurred while this charge was pending, and Rocky was in jail in a neighboring county. Rocky had a lot to say about the Tahoe, the Edwards family, and Stephanie and Tiffany Cochran. Rocky always maintained he did not steal the Tahoe. He said Raymond Edwards, in a roundabout way, was trying to pay him to get rid of that Tahoe, and that's how the Tahoe came to be in his possession. He never did specify what that roundabout way was, though. Rocky was asked how much he was paid to take the Tahoe. He said no money was ever transferred. According to law enforcement sources, Rocky West was found with the Tahoe at a car wash in Birmingham, and some parts of the interior of the vehicle had been painted with black paint. They asked Rocky what the inside of the truck looked like when he got it. He said it looked like it had been spray-painted, He said when he got the truck, it had already been cleaned out and there was nothing inside of it. By the time of the alleged theft of the Tahoe, Rocky was then dating the other sister, Tiffany Cochran. He said after the vehicle was in his possession, he noticed that Tiffany was acting strange and she didn't want anything to do with the Tahoe. He said he didn't know what was going on or why they were all acting like they were, but it clearly made him nervous. One day, Tiffany put some clothes in his truck. Rocky described how he felt the whole thing with the Tahoe had been a setup to make it look like he had done something to Jessica Hamby. He saw the clothing and thought Tiffany had put Jessica's clothes in his truck. He took the clothes and burned them. From what we've been told, 
law enforcement did find some burned clothing in a chicken house on Rocky's mother's property. That property contains a pond, and we were told that when law enforcement asked for consent to search the pond area, the property owner refused. Rocky told the investigators that he'd never met or spoken to Jessica. The SBI agent asked him if he had spoken to any of the Cochran girls since the investigator had last spoken to him, and he emphatically said no. Rocky said, you'd never catch him talking to them or messing around over there on that edge of the woods ever again. He repeatedly said to investigators, they're crooked. He said, that is some crooked ass shit they've got going on down there. They asked Rocky what he meant. Again, he repeated that they are crooked. They asked him if he meant the Edwards family. He said, right, as in Raymond, Louise, Eric, Tiffany Cochran, Stephanie Cochran, and Kim Cochran. Kim is Stephanie and Tiffany's mother and Louise's sister. We are unsure if Rocky has ever admitted to this but we have been told that two family members of his stated that Rocky had them clean the Tahoe. Jessica's dad, Keith, told us that after law enforcement impounded the Tahoe, the SBI thoroughly tested the vehicle for any forensic evidence. Keith said an SBI agent told him that was the cleanest vehicle they'd ever seen. Rocky also told the SBI agent and the private investigator that Hackelberg Chief Kenny Hallmark called and left a voicemail on his mother's phone saying that Rocky needed to come see him at the Hackelberg Police Department because he was pretty sure that Rocky was being accused of something that he didn't have anything to do with. Rocky believed that Chief Hallmark was talking about Jessica Hamby's disappearance. He stated that they called Chief Hallmark back numerous times, but he never answered or returned their calls. When the private investigator went to the Edwards home to speak to Louise in the spring of 2018, Tiffany and Stephanie were both present. Tiffany recounted a somewhat similar story, as Rocky told about the Tahoe. She stated that he was crazy and paranoid. Tiffany said that one day, she and her cousin, Brandy McKay, went through her clothes to get rid of what she no longer wanted. She said, I started to wear a shirt, a jacket, and a pair of black pants. Well, I had thrown it in the back of Rocky's truck. She said they went to his house and Rocky took her to the barn. She said she took a nap in the truck and woke up to Rocky beating on the window. He opened the door and told her to look at what he'd found. He had the jacket and pants laid out on the ground and was taking photos of them. He accused her of trying to cover for her cousin, Eric Edwards. Louise, Tiffany, and Stephanie were all asked by the private investigator what they knew about Rocky stealing the vehicle. Tiffany spoke up and said, Well, they say I did too. I was in jail for it. Records do show that Tiffany was arrested by the Marion County Sheriff's Office on March 12, 2018 for theft of property first and obstruction of justice from providing a false ID to law enforcement. The private investigator asked her if she and Rocky stole the vehicle. Tiffany said, They say but they found Rocky's belongings and paperwork. The case against Rocky was set to go to trial in June 2019, but was dismissed on the motion of the prosecutor. According to Rocky's attorney, everyone felt like there was some shady dealings going on with the Tahoe and how Rocky came to be in possession of it, so the charge was dropped. Rocky's attorney recounted something that he witnessed when he went to visit Rocky at the jail. Eric Edwards was also in jail at that time, and he said there was a heated dispute between Rocky and Eric. Rocky insisted to Eric that they asked him to take the Tahoe and that they had set him up. 
Rocky's attorney said Eric denied it. As we mentioned in the last episode, Hackleburg Police Chief Kenny Hallmark was involved in Jessica's missing persons case from early on in the investigation. He conducted an interview of the 14-year-old minor that lived in the Edwards home. We gave her the alias of Anne in a previous episode. It actually appears Chief Hallmark interviewed Anne at least twice, as we've been told the first time he spoke with her was when she got off the school bus one afternoon, but he later had her mother bring her in for a formal interview. We shared the details of her interview in an earlier episode, but there was one portion of the interview we didn't discuss. We have the transcript from this interview and not the audio recording. I'm going to read you a small portion of the transcript. There are three speakers, Hallmark, Anne, and Louise Edwards. Anne says, Y'all need to find Tiffany. Put her in jail. Louise, if somebody wasn't involved in something and they kept thinking somebody's trying to set them up for it, would you think they was guilty or for any reason? Hallmark, I would. Louise, that's what I was thinking, because Rocky West, he'll get messed up, and he thinks Tiffany is trying to set him up for that girl's, uh, murder. Hallmark. Uh Uh-huh. Louise. Don't make sense. She, she got some garbage out of the apartment and some clothes she threw away. Hallmark. Yeah. Louise. And she was telling me that then they, they didn't dump, dump her in the dumpster. You know, at the apartments, though, it was in the back of his truck. She said he took her somewhere on a dirt road or something, and he got them out got the garbage out, got the clothes out, and took pictures of it, and said she was trying to set him up for the girl's murder, and then he burnt the clothes, some of Tiffany's old clothes. But she said every time he gets that way, he says somebody's trying to set him up for that girl's murder. Said how's he even know that she's been murdered? Said he must be guilty of something, what it sounds like. Anne. So did he really steal the Tahoe? Louise. Stephanie said that one night, Hallmark, did who steal a Tahoe? Anne, Rocky, Hallmark, what'd you hear? Anne, I heard that he stole a Tahoe. Hallmark, okay. Anne, I think Tiffany was part of it too. Louise, of what? Anne, stealing the Tahoe. She needed money more than he did. Louise, ain't got nothing to do with money. Anne, for Tiffany and Stephanie, it's all about money. They will do anything. Louise, well, I think if they was in on it, that, that, uh, because Tiffany done said that Rocky held a gun to her head and knowing him because he, like when Stephanie would see him, he said, have you ever been drugged? Somebody said he tied up his last girlfriend to the pickup and drug her. And he asked Stephanie, said, have you ever been drugged by the back of a pickup? And he pulled down a dirt road. Stephanie kicked him in the face. Anne, of course she would. Louise, think he got away if he got caught because he thinks Tiffany's Raymond's niece and that he would get away with it. Anne, oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, Cody was beating Stephanie up, too. Louise. Yeah, I know. He's in jail now. In the spring of 2018, the private investigator conducted one interview with Raymond Edwards, numerous interviews with Louise, and Stephanie and Tiffany Cochran were present for several of them. As we listened to these interviews, we couldn't help but notice the inconsistencies in the stories when it was asked where Tiffany and Stephanie were the night that Jessica was dropped off with Eric, Alicia, Derek, and Shane. A couple times, I would even describe the ensuing responses to the questions as a bit chaotic. One time, when they were asked where they were, 
Tiffany and Stephanie, speaking at the same time, both said that they weren't there and that they were with their boyfriends. Louise was speaking at the same time, too, but much louder, almost as if trying to talk over them. She loudly said, Y'all weren't here. Tiffany went on to explain that at the time, she was dating Tran and Frederick, and Stephanie was dating Rocky West. During another interview, Tiffany and Stephanie were directly asked if they were at Gilbert Shaw's the night Jessica was dropped off there. They never did directly answer that question. Stephanie can be heard mumbling something about Motel 6. Tiffany dodged the question altogether and retold a story about how they got a free room at the Motel 6 in Hamilton, and Louise told both women, no, they weren't there at Gilbert's because they were in Tunica. In this instance, like the others where they were asked about their whereabouts that night, it is difficult to hear exactly what's being said by each. It seems they were trying to talk over each other. Fortunately, with the ability to slow the audio down and with the use of headphones, in most instances, we are able to identify each voice and their exact words. Six and a half minutes later into the same interview, Stephanie, who'd been the quieter of the three in this particular interview, spoke up. She said that she was looking at her pictures in her phone to see where she was around the 3rd of January. She explained, that's what she went by to remember where she was or what she was doing on a specific date. She said that on the 1st, she went to Memphis to Beale Street. She explained that at that time, she was dating Rocky West and Tiffany was with Trannon Frederick. She said they told Rocky and Trannon they didn't want to see them and didn't want them around. Tiffany jumped in to say they wanted to do their own thing and they didn't want their boyfriends around that weekend. The use of the word weekend was the first clue that the story might be suspect because the first was on a Monday and the day Jessica disappeared was Wednesday the 3rd. On September 17th, 2022, Stephanie Cochran began commenting on a Facebook post I made on the podcast page about Eric's most recent arrest and stay in jail. He's currently still in the Marion County Jail, and this arrest is unrelated to Jessica Hamby. I replied to one of Stephanie's comments and asked her where she and Tiffany were when Jessica disappeared. Stephanie's reply was a surprise. She said, Yeah, I can tell you where I was at. I was staying at the Motel 6, and my sister, she was locked up in the Russellville City Jail, I do believe. But I do want y'all to find her for her kids' sake and parents, and y'all have did a great job so far. But all I'm saying is stop accusing Eric, because you can accuse someone so much, it eventually becomes slander. Hmm... Tiffany was in the Russellville City Jail? That's the first time we've ever heard Tiffany was in jail at that time. Michael prepared a request for inmate records, and we sent it to the City of Russellville Police Department. The records provided did prove Tiffany was in jail. According to the arresting officer's affidavit, on the date of January 1, 2018, the Russellville officer met with a Hackleburg officer at the intersection on Highway 43 and College Road in Phil Campbell to arrest the subject, Tiffany Cochran, for her active warrant with the city of Russellville and transported her to the police department without further incident. The Edwards property has a Hamilton mailing address, but it is located in an unincorporated part of Marion County, and the property is actually closer to Hackleburg than it is to Hamilton. The Edwards property 
appears to be approximately three and a half miles outside of Hackleburg city limits and just outside of their police jurisdiction. According to the records provided, which were very thorough and complete, the Russellville officer met with the Hackleburg officer and arrested Tiffany at 11.45 p.m. on January 1, 2018. Note, this is the same day that Rocky West drove Eric on a dope run to Tennessee, in which he told investigators he believed Eric was setting him up to be busted by Hackleburg Police Chief Kenny Hallmark. Tiffany's home address on the records is listed as the Edwards home on Elgin Cochran Road. She was booked into the Russellville City Jail at 12.07 a.m. on January 2, 2018, and she was released from jail on January 3, 2018 at 3.30 p.m. A quick search of social media did reveal that Stephanie and Tiffany's story about the trip to Memphis wasn't a complete lie. They did go to Memphis, and they posted a photo of the two of them there on New Year's Eve. However, that's not the story the two of them told the private investigator. Stephanie explicitly stated she went to Memphis to Bill Street on the 1st. Maybe she was on Bill Street on the 1st at some point in time, but that's not the day she went to Memphis. While she didn't explicitly state they were there on the 2nd and 3rd of January, that is very clearly the impression both she and Tiffany were trying to convey. The question is why? You know what one of the best alibis in the world has to be? Being in jail. That's not something you forget, and you have to wonder just why Tiffany or Stephanie haven't mentioned that in the last four and a half years. While we don't know yet exactly where Hackleburg PD encountered Tiffany on the night of January 1st, we are pretty certain it wasn't in Hamilton at the Motel 6 as that would be approximately seven miles out of Hackleburg's jurisdiction. Stephanie and Tiffany had other interesting things to tell the private investigator during his interviews with Louise. Tiffany told him that she'd never even seen Jessica. Stephanie said that she had met her the year before. Tiffany told him that a woman named Tila told her that she did know Jessica, Tila was living on the Edwards property with a man named Dale Williams, who worked for Raymond. It is unclear if she was living there at the time of Jessica's disappearance, but Tiffany also stated that Tila had been interviewed by law enforcement investigators, so that might suggest they believed it was possible that she could have been around on January 2nd or 3rd. Others have recently come forward to claim Tila told them she was with Jessica on the night and morning she disappeared. Tila was originally from Haleyville, and she and Jessica did know each other. They were associated with the same group of people. In fact, at one point in time, Tila and Jesse Abbott were an item. On May 1st, 2018, the private investigator went to the Edwards home to interview Louise. Stephanie Cochran and other family members were present. The investigator told Louise in a later recorded conversation that when he was getting into his truck to leave that day, Stephanie crawled out a window of their home, came to his truck to stop him from leaving, and shared a new story with him. She told him about the drug dealer that Eric bought drugs from in Tennessee. The guy's nickname was Twitch. Stephanie told Jeff that on one of Eric's prior trips to pick up drugs from Twitch, a woman named Heather, who'd ridden with them, stole Twitch's wallet. Stephanie claimed that Twitch was angry and wanted to kill this person who stole the wallet. 
Stephanie said that instead of saying that Heather did it, Eric pinned it on Jessica. Stephanie went on to say that Twitch demanded that Jessica be brought to him in Tennessee and that Eric took Jessica to him. This story that Stephanie told is one that surfaced very early into the investigation. According to Jessica's dad, Keith, law enforcement went to Tennessee to interview Twitch, and according to what they told him, they were able to rule out Twitch as having any involvement in Jessica's disappearance. However, the story has come up over and over again. On another occasion, Stephanie again told the investigator that Heather stole the wallet. Heather adamantly denied that. She did acknowledge that she'd made the trip to Tennessee with them before, but she explained that not only did she not steal his wallet, she didn't go around Twitch. She spent all her time there with Twitch's wife, and that both would have known that she didn't have an opportunity to steal his wallet. Rocky West also brought up the stolen wallet. He said that Tiffany stole the dope dealer's wallet on one of the trips to Tennessee, and he said he'd heard that they blamed it on Jessica, and that's what happened to her. Again, any connection to Jessica and the dealer in Tennessee has already been disproven, and Jessica never went to Tennessee with the Edwards group. Out of all this, the most curious part of it to me is that Stephanie Cochran had every opportunity to tell the private investigator about the stolen wallet during the lengthy conversation he had with all of them at Raymond and Louise's home, but she didn't. Instead, she waited until he was walking to his truck to leave, and she climbed out a window to tell this story out of the earshot of the rest of her family. The private investigator shared approximately two hours and 20 minutes of audio of him speaking to Louise, Stephanie, Tiffany, and sometimes even Anne was present. There was something that struck me as I listened to these interviews. The women almost never spoke Jessica's name. When they spoke of her, they most often used the words she or the phrases, the girl, or the one that is like nails on a chalkboard to me, that girl. In fact, I only counted three instances in which any of them called Jessica by her name, and in all three of those instances, it was Louise. Maybe this has no meaning, but she has a name, and I think generally speaking, most people call others by their names, especially when there's care and concern. When the private investigators interviewed Raymond Edwards, he told them that Stephanie got mad at Eric and told people that Jessica's body had been taken to Florence. He said he didn't know who she told, but he'd heard she'd even gone to the Marion County Jail telling that story. He also told them that he'd sent Stephanie a text to let her know that they were coming there to speak with him that day and that they would be at his business, and he asked her to come over there to talk to them with him, but Stephanie never responded to that request, and she didn't show up. Raymond noted that when he had told her the private investigators were coming that day, she'd said, about what? The way Raymond repeated and demonstrated how Stephanie said it gave the impression that it was said with annoyance. Eric, Stephanie, and Tiffany have another outspoken cousin named Brandy McKay. Brandy is yet another one of the family members who claims not to know anything, but then leaves comments online that would suggest otherwise. In 2018, a local online publication called Pen and Sword published an article about Eric Edwards titled Prison Spotlight. It discussed Eric's recent arrest and his connection to Jessica's disappearance. 
one very observant listener to the podcast found a comment that Brandy left on the article, and she noticed one very specific statement in it. I'm not going to read the comment in its entirety, and I can't help but point out that Brandy also referred to Jessica as the girl in her post. The girl has a name. It's Jessica Leanne Hamby. The comment that the listener noticed is this. Brandy wrote, My cousin lives with his parents, and he had friends there, along with his girlfriend and his brother. Really, Brandy? Do tell who these friends were, because that's definitely not the story that's been told all these years. While we know Jessica was at the Edwards property, that is not where Jessica, Eric Edwards, and the others spent most of the night and morning hours. But there's no doubt in our minds that wherever they were, it involved other friends. Yet the whole family would rather place a missing woman at their home than tell the truth about where they all were who they were really with, and what happened to Jessica Hamby. While I can't tell you where Stephanie Cochran was when Jessica arrived in Hamilton on the night of the 2nd, or where she was when Jessica vanished on the morning of January 3rd, I can tell you this. Both Stephanie and Tiffany have been wildly inconsistent with their statements about where they were. Tiffany had the best alibi she could have, yet she chose not to use it. You have to question the reason for this. Because when you have nothing to hide, you tell the truth. And the truth doesn't change. At the end of this season, we are going to have a questions and answers episode. We invite you to leave your question or comment about content we've shared in the podcast so that we can answer you. Call 205-624-7551 and just leave your question or comment at the beep. While you don't have to identify yourself, if you do, we'd love to give you a shout out and thank you for your support. We may want to use your audio recording from this service when we answer you, so if you don't want us to do that, please let us know that in your message and we won't. We can't wait to hear what you leave us. Join us next time as we further explore what happened to both Jessica Hamby and Jeremy Abbott and as we continue to investigate and push for justice for them both. If you have any information that could help to solve the disappearance of Jessica Hamby, please email me at secretstruecrime at gmail.com or call our confidential tip line at 205 282 0740. Michael and I will ensure that all information gets to the right place right away. If you are left still wanting even more content, please check us out on Patreon. We have it filled with great information about Susan and Evan, Eric and Gypsy, and we will continue adding additional content about Jessica and Jeremy. This podcast is an independent podcast. That means that everything that goes into making this podcast is done and funded by me. All the investigative tools and resources are provided by Echo 7 Foxtrot. The tragedies we highlight and investigate have had a tremendous impact on the victims, loved ones, and friends. We don't burden them with additional expenses to cover their cases. We donate our time and talents because we want to help and hope to find the answers they need that are so long overdue. For as little as $5 per month, you can receive exclusive access to members-only photos, videos, early access to episodes, and much, much more. 
by becoming a patron, you too are helping us help these families. Patreon.com slash Secrets Crime. I'll also post the link on our Facebook page. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to follow or subscribe in your podcast player of choice and by giving us a five-star rating and review. We are active on social media and will often share photos of Jessica and Jeremy. Follow Secrets True Crime on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Secrets Crime. This episode was co-written by me and Michael Fleming. The audio production for this podcast is by Kane Power at PrecisionPodcasting.com.